<laughs> Your meeting is being recorded. Oh, already? Okay. Pause. How do I have to pause? <laughs> Software meeting. Um, I think uh, before we start, it might be useful if we just go around the room here at UCL first, and then the UCL at RAL, and then uh, see who is joining us online. Um, so uh, why don't we start on the left of our room here? Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm Alex and I'm a PhD student for Okay. Hi there, uh, I'm Richard, uh, postdoc, working with Chris, uh, developing a lot of stuff in, in SERP. I'm Ian Yachin, I'm coming from SDFC, also a developer and project manager. Joe Blankenstein, one of the investigators, Mark. Uh, Casper, the Castle Lewis, I'm with King's uh, PhD student in King, Image Reconstruction Machine Learning. Great. Andrew Reader. And I'm Andrew Reader, and uh, I'm interested in Im image reconstruction for pets and uh, machine learning increasingly, and so, yeah, great to get all that thing. So. I'm Will Hallett, uh, a physicist at the Big Pro, where we have a pet alarm. I'm Ben Thomas, I'm one of the researchers at the Institute of Pets. Okay, uh, before we go ahead, can you guys hear us when we're talking or do we need to shut the... Yeah, I think, I think it's better if you raise your voice if you are far from the microphone. Yeah, just all of this right now. But <laughs> yeah, you're all crowded that part. So. <laughs> anyway, we, we can move the chair, it's, it's on our wheels. So. Good, uh, Raul, please. Okay, so here at Raul, uh, is uh, Eduardo Pasca from STFC. Yeah, I'm Gemma Poulter. I'm in the software engineering group at STFC, and I'm going to be um, working on putting some of your code onto Anvil, which is our continuous integration testing service. Thank you. I'm, I'm Vangelis Papuzelis, research associate at the University of Manchester School of Materials. I'm Evelyn Amietova. I've just started also in the University of Manchester and I will be working on the CCPI project. I'm Jakob Jorgensen. I'm also in Manchester and we're all, the three of us are all involved in the CCPI flagship multi-channel reconstruction project. All right. Great. Thank you. So, uh, who else is online? Seems like it's just me, Martin Turner. I was planning on being physically at both locations, but then I failed at both. Uh, yeah, <laughs> would, have been, would have been hard anyway, so... Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank you. So, uh, I think, Edo, it might be useful if you send or add names to the meeting minutes later on, because it's kind of hard for us to catch all of that. Um, great, so I'll try and minimize this bit a little bit. So uh, clearly our Zoom session is being recorded um, and will be put on the website uh, together with minutes and slides. So uh, <clears throat> for today, um, we thought it would be uh, useful to give a update really of the new things, uh, somewhat dramatically new things which have been added to serve. Not all of it has been merged onto master yet, but that's maybe something we can briefly discuss as well. And so uh, the first one over there is integration with the CCPI uh, library, which is why uh, we see so many people in RAL joining us, which is fantastic. Um, and Richard will talk about what he's been doing with Surfredge, which has been merged onto master and what that means for all of us. Um, and I'll then give a brief update from Palak, who unfortunately just wasn't feeling very well. So uh, she said she might try and buy him, but that doesn't seem to happen either. So I'll, I'll just do my best to give, I have her slides to give you a, uh, a five minute update on where we are with pen support for the, the signal. And then I, put Richard there, but I think it's just a little bit up to all of us to give us a summary of our previous hackathon um, at King's and, and just to 
for the people who weren't there give you a flavor and then also for the people who were there to see what happened since then. Uh, that will lead us into some discussion on our next steps that we need to take for synergistic reconstruction. We don't have any slides for that. I think it's just an open discussion on, on where we need to go. And then uh, somewhat related to that uh, is, or, well, you know, not really related to next steps for synergistic reconstruction, but to the previous things, is which bits we uh, include in surf release version two, which is in the very near future uh, on our plan. So that means we can't uh, be too optimistic there. And so we'll have a discussion on that. And then we just uh, talk about future meetings and any other business. So uh, all that said, I think it's now up to uh, Eduardo. So uh, do I stop sharing? i just do that. Yes. Okay, so you wanted to see some code, so I prepared a fantastic Jupyter notebook. Uh, let me know if you see, if you hear well. Yes, all fine. Okay. Okay, so um, first of all, this Jupyter notebook runs on on the virtual machine, the the new one, so the 1804, uh, which I had a few troubles to put together, but not too many. Uh, and this is my browser. So it's on my host. Uh, so just a quick um, resume of what the CIL is, just to set kind of expectation. CIL is a very heterogeneous collection of software for computer tomography. It ranges from beam hardening correction, uh, a piece of code that it doesn't work by itself, it needs a special acquisition at a scanner with a special uh, object uh, with known uh, size and whatever. Uh, and then we have a number of iterative algorithms uh, kind of optimized for multi-threading CPU in C++. Uh, we have segmentation codes. We have some other post-processing like digital volume correlation which is kind of now you uh, very fashionable as here at the facilities they tend to acquire multiple tomograms with uh, in time say uh, time series with i don't know adding strain uh, onto the sample changing temperature and doing all sorts of things so uh, correlating to different images of volumes uh, in this series it's uh, it's a very complicated job and we've got some codes to do that and there is also a visualization uh, tool that I've written in BTK and yeah, provides the basis of something that we can use to create an app that uh, the users can then use to do something like, for instance, I'm now working at an app to configure the digital volume correlation uh, uh, bit. Okay, so having said that, uh, with Jakob, uh, last year, basically, uh, we set up together and decided to write a piece of code that we called framework to be able to write reconstruction algorithms uh, quickly, uh, kind of independently of the ingredients we use, because the, the algorithms, the optimization algorithms are one thing, but then when you pass the objects you want to optimize, you can change regularization terms, you can change uh, objective function or fidelity and stuff like that. So uh, we we found ourselves in a, in a position of rewriting many times the same codes because of we wanted to change a fidelity term or another term. So we kind of tried to abstract this uh, in a way that we write the algorithm and then we can use and mix and match uh, the other ingredients. Um, okay, so let me so this this is an example i uh, modified this uh, grappa and gradient uh, descent from surf examples so let me show you uh, i'm importing a few things uh, from surf and i'm importing a few things from uh, the ccpi uh, so this would be uh, our fidelity term this is no fun at all. So it is just a function that does nothing. 
and here I import uh, a, one of these regularizers. <clears throat> the algorithms will be, uh, I, I, I have the whole code of the algorithm so that you will see it all together. And yeah, that's basically it. Okay, so um, how deeply do you want to see it? I'll, I'll, I'll just run it. Uh, first, and then if you want to know, I, I show you things. So, okay. So, first of all, I prepared the data and uh, the acquisition model. It's basically the same uh, example that has been run, uh, that is in the examples. Uh, so, I'm not entirely sure what uh, all of this really is, but so now it's calling Gadgetron to reconstruct this uh, data set here. <clears throat> So actually, first of all, we do some pre-processing with this gadget chain, and then we create a graph reconstruction, reconstructor, we recon, reconstruct, and then we use the, the output to create, uh, ah, okay, so to create the acquisition data, the acquisition model and the simulated data here. So if you want to know more, ask, don't ask me, because I'm not very uh, confident in that. So now here it comes the, the business of our integration. So we, uh, we want to optimize uh, this uh, type of norm. So where A is the operator that, or the acquisition model, X is the, uh, the image data and B is the acquisition data. So we want to optimize this uh, uh, this uh, problem. Uh, so here we are creating exactly this function. We we pass A, we pass B, and we pass C as uh, in this initialization. Um, here I create also a, a random initialization image data by shuffling the data that uh, is the actual um, solution. The reason for that I used this trick is just I wanted to have an, an image data uh, as an input which was ra uh, quite random, but it had the proper values, I mean, the proper range. So this is the image that we are going to use at, as an initialization. Then um, you remember I had this problem of exploding. Uh, so my optimization, so, uh, uh, in FISTA was not optimizing this, the objective function was going up. So Jakob uh, told me, well, uh, uh, this linear operators should uh, respect this rule. So then uh, if you apply onto an image data, the operator and you m multiply it, I don't know, with the kind of a product to the acquisition, and then you invert the thing, so you, 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 yeah, this, that should be about the same. So, so I, say, on the right hand side, the X and Y should be square. No. Yes. Sorry? You need to swap X and Y. Right. And the... y should be swap. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> right. Anyway, so I, I test it and it's it's okay at the fourth decimal, decimal so the relative this, this, the difference. Um, then we calculate this uh, Lipschitz constant, which is um, for gradient descent, or for, it's, it's, it's a measure, uh, my friends mathematicians will know better, it's a kind of a measure of the convexity of the problem. Uh, and Okay, so it's now time to calculate it. For MR, it should be about one uh, because it's a Fourier transform. Mathematician tell me, and then here we have 0 0.99, so we are kind of okay. Now, uh, I'll say these are just widgets from IPython to make things uh, look so cool. <laughs> uh, did I execute? Yeah. yeah. Um, and now I instantiate a gradient descent algorithm. Uh, I pass the initialization, the objective function, 
and the rate at which you want the uh, the next step to be calculated. So nothing happens at this stage, you just set up the things. Uh, and then you can pass information like the maximum number of uh, iteration. So it, our algorithms are currently iterable, so you can put it in a for loop and they will just iterate until they reach the a stop uh, that you, <coughs> you can pass. Currently is maximum iteration, but it can be defined. Um, so now, now here, uh, I'm just creating a plot and in the, so here, here is the iteration. So the algorithm, it's iterable, so you can iterate on it uh, and it will stop once you reach, it reaches the, the end, which in this case is max iteration. And here it's just, I mean, you can put anything, it's, it's just giving some information to the user. And uh, so here you will see the image forming and this is the convergence or the, so the objective function that uh, the algorithm is uh, finding at, at each iteration. So, so you see that, so this gradient descent is uh, really descending and getting to a solution. And so I put 15, uh, 20 iterations, so we will reach 20 and then it will stop. Come on, ah uh, yeah, maybe recording Zoom and doing this starts to be uh, a bit tricky for my computer. So this is the solution the algorithm has found. It's, it's stopped by itself and uh, we can use Casper's um, uh, progress bar to, to show the progress rather than what I did. Um, but yeah, I also added to screen this uh, numbers. So this is the optimization function, how much, uh, how it goes. Um, now we go to the FISTA implementation. Uh, so FISTA is a, still a gradient type of uh, optimization algorithm, but you can pass, it's a splitting algorithm, so you can give a regularization term and it can treat it kind of independently than the data fidelity term. Um, so this is a, a no regularizer so this doesn't do anything and this is the regularizer it, it's i need to we need to wrap our regularizer in, inside something that surf can handle especially because when when our regularizer outputs its output it's not uh, the image data of surf it's uh, it's image data from CCPI. So we, what I do, I, I just take the output and I stick it in into an image data from Surf and I just created the factory to, to create the wrapping. Anyway, again, the initialization of the algorithm goes as uh, for the gradient descent. So you pass an initialization, you, see, you say what function you want to uh, minimize and what regularizer you want to use. It can be none or, or any. Uh, I think if it's none, you, you get the no fun, the zero fun. So if we run this, that's the same. So now FISTA is iterating and uh, <clears throat> goes down. And I think you will see that by, by iteration five, the regularized FISTA has already converged. Basically, the regularizer removes all the freedom to the algorithm to do other things, right? So whatever it does, it doesn't change the, the result. Uh, okay. And the objective function that is calculated here, you may notice it has a very different value from the graded descent because it's a different optimization. Uh, now here I run the same FISTA but with, without the regularizer and I actually put 20 iteration like the gradient descent because you will see that this in this case FISTA doesn't converge in five iteration it would take uh, slightly longer. So uh, yeah 
so it takes longer. So at five, it's still going down and it goes down for, I think at 20, it's still going relatively down. Yeah. <coughs> but it's actually in the noise. So it's, it's not going to change uh, much the, the, the image. Okay, yeah, so at 20 stopped. Uh, and just to conclude, okay, so FISTA has converged a little better than gradient descent. So to conclude, I just plot the, the convergence uh, with, with respect to iteration, the relative convergence. So FISTA re regularized as converged uh, earlier, but to a, a higher um, value relatively higher and yeah they are, the gradient descent is still descending and the, the FISTA is also still descending and here this is just the plot of the um, Eduardo, can I ask you a question? sure you can can you hear me i was just i thought you didn't you say FISTA is a form of a sort of a, a gradient uh, algorithm like a descent algorithm yes and yeah in that so the last simulation you showed us, the objective function went upwards at one point. So, so that that can happen with FISTA. It's not monotonic. It, it it's not guaranteed to be decaying all the time. There is a monotonic version of it you can implement, which is almost equivalent, slightly more expensive, but will guarantee that it won't increase on the objective function. But I think also, I mean, gradient descent is not guaranteed to go down all the time, or maybe with the right rate. It, it depends on how you set the step sizes and yeah. so on. <clears throat> so, and yeah, just the last thing is that this is the plot that I gave you for the submission. <coughs> oh no the, i you wanted oh ah, yeah you wanted this yeah so if you want to have more details i can sh just show you uh gradient descent how it looks how the, you, it's defined uh, <coughs> right this is gradient descent so there is this initialization uh there is a a rule to stop and then basically this is the only method that the user has to uh, well no this these are the methods that the user has to implement the setup and the update so this is the update rule so this is the solution this is uh, the grade so this is the gradient of the objective function which is calculated at x and then you multiply it by the rate and then you have your update uh, and then you can update the objective. Uh, I think it's currently updated at each iteration. They tell me that that might not be um, a good idea because it might be expensive. Uh, but I mean, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So if you have uh, other question, questions, What's your input data again? You, you so, yes. Reconstructed image that you used as yours. Okay, so this, I think this is the reconstructed image from Gadgetron. Yeah. Right? Uh, and then what I pass to the gradient descent is the scrambled version. So it's this thing. So I take the the, day, the the solution, I shuffle it, and then I pass it. Is that just for the initial guess? It's the initial guess, yes. What B specifically the data? What what's the data? What's the B sample? Is it where so we cannot hear you very well uh, david 
and that's that's the question for you, Benny. So yeah, see, they, they do more projection for the constructed image. So it's got nothing to, to in a sense, it's got nothing to do with the original acquisition. No. All right, you've done no. some, some right. gadgetron stuff to get an image. That's your starting point. So the fact that the original data was graph or whatever is in a sense is right. irrelevant. So this is a Sort of a no, I think they got. I think they got it wrong. The scramble data is just the initial guess. I think they're asking about the data. What's the B? What's the what's the simulated data? Yeah. I, well, this is a, yeah. This is this data, right? Uh, it's red here. There is a acquisition process a process at the beginning to clean it. I think. Then it's passed to the Cartesian graph reconstructor. <coughs> and then you have this image data. I think we start from that and then we create the, the acquisition model. Uh, and we pass the coil sensitivity maps. I mean, you teach me in this field, I just copied uh, the example that was already there with the gradient descent. And uh, so this is this, the data that we give to the uh, algorithm as uh, as acquisition data. But the initialization of the algorithm, right, the image data that we pass as an in initialization, well, in initial guess, is this, but scrambled, so it's this actually. I just did this trick of scrambling, scrambling this one because I didn't want to get bothered by getting uh, wrong, uh, you know, range of numbers. I thought, okay, I, I give something that is uh, not coherent like this, and it should be okay. But yeah, yeah it might be, it might be a problem. Eduardo, uh, I think that's all okay. So we've been asking a few times what is the data here now. So. It would, as opposed to doing the simulation here, it would have been better to just reconstruct the data that you read in at the beginning. Yes. Right. How do how do I do it? Well, you just give data, data instead of simulation. Yeah. Excuse me. You could use ACQ underscore data instead of simulated underscore data. Right. Yeah. This well, one. let's do that. Right. Now. But what I find now slightly weird is that the reconstructed image looks noisy. Uh, really, it's a forward simulation; it shouldn't be noisy at all. So that's a bit weird. But uh, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess there's a few details there, but generally it's quite impressive. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's actually, you know, it's not on the sample. But, no. So it's, that that I have. Not been asking a few times, but I don't know what that data is that simulated access. The original thing that we're reading. Is that on the sample, yes or no? Really? Like it to be if it was a, a was a grapher on the sample acquisition. So yeah, now it's much more hard. Right. So the, the sensitivities that you've used, are they made up or are they take, taken from the data? I don't understand how this uh -huh. I, I used the, 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 the um, yeah, I just copied the other example that you, you had, so it's, I don't know. Sure. Well, I mean, I think we all know that gradient descent without line search can go can go bonkers. Yes, so uh, uh, fine. I, so maybe this is not really something to keep on banging on about about what the data is, but it does that simulate the data that we have in there needs to be documented on what it is. It's only person who knows is again, so that has to be documented then. And ideally, I think we say how this was generated, and I know it was Elias MRMLD something, but we just need to know. It's a, it's a question that comes out all the time. Uh, but aside from that, you know, 
high. So this, this is this is great stuff, and we will have to try it with real measure data and all of those things. But I, I think the, the overall message is that it enhances the capabilities of search quite a lot. Yes. Yeah. Uh, At so least we can do it. <laughs> if we produce garbage, it's another option. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's that's great stuff. Um, so obviously, for people who don't know, um, in the first hackathon, uh, Matthias, in using some of this framework, implemented a, a pet-specific stochastic uh, gradient descent type of algorithm that he's been working on. That also fits in this framework. Um, and nothing stops us from using gradient descent or whatever on the platforms, really this particular implementation. Uh, I don't know if uh, FISTA would be suitable for Passong or likelihood type of things. Jakob, do you know? Or? So that's the cool back Likla. Yeah. Yeah. I think it should I be fine, it, yeah. yeah. I'm guessing FISTA is a non-constraint algorithm? Uh, yes. Yes, you just have two terms, a sum of two terms. We call convex. So convex. Convex. Yeah, it does not look like it is convex, but we normally, well, it, it blows up, yes. Um, and we usually implement positivity constraints on the image. That's maybe not something that Pista can do. Uh, you mean the positivity constraint? But well, actually, actually, one thing you can do is you can, for the regularizer, you can just have non-negativity constraints. So you can take whatever convex fidelity term you like, and then instead of a regularizer, you can have non-negativity. That would work fine too. Yeah. I don't know if you can have all three. But at least you can have either. Uh, yeah, I, I guess you would have to do something with barrier functions and so on, I suppose. Yes. Is it then? Ah, uh, it's a non-convex, sorry, non-smooth. No, area. it's no, it's fine. It's convex. Non-negativity. That's fine. That's all nice and convex. No, yeah, it's convex and it, it's not smooth, but that's okay for Fista. Yeah. For Fista, that's fine. Mm. Okay. We are working on other algorithms where we can have several terms, right? So I think we can have both, yeah. not in FISTA, <laughs> but maybe in the primal dual, yeah. we can have th three or more terms. Yes. Um, yeah. But it, it's not quite... We have the regularizer, the fidelity, and the positivity constraint. That should be fine, yeah? Right. Because when you have the, when you compute the proximal for the positivity, you're not just taking a... Projection on the... Positive code. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. <coughs> so, yeah. so not not today we can do it, but it's something that's <coughs> that's coming. But I'm saying it, at least initially we could try running it with the the Poisson likelihood and a non-negativity. That would be something that we can run with what we've got at the moment. I think that we have. Some of the regularizers from Daniel, they also uh, enforce non-negativity. Okay, we would need to look at how that's implemented, if that fits in the framework of how you would use a prox, but it's... Yeah, great. Uh, it's good stuff. I um, think, uh, look at this one, for instance. No? Any, any so we'd have to look at what what they do if if it's well defined. I'm I'm, I'm not completely sure what it. Any, any other so way? by the way, this example is in the exercises in a in a branch. I think I called it CIL. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe. Sorry, um, in the exercises. Uh, 
and need to come back at the end on, on merging stuff and so on, but let's keep that for later. Great, any other questions on all of this or remarks? <coughs> Did you say it was going in a paper? Uh, okay, so we, so Daniel um, has submitted to Fully 3D, which is a conference on uh, the construction algorithms mostly, uh, covering various modalities. There will be PT there a lot, and then some more these days, more and more, I suppose, and, and some kind of whatever. So uh, that was a abstract on the uh, regularizers that we used uh, Matthias is as PDG algorithm of the demonstration for that. Um, these images here that Eduardo showed have been included in the PSMR submission on SURF as a uh, flexible tool. And so uh, the CIL integration is talked about over here and it's included. And uh, so I don't know if we can discuss some of that in our forthcoming surf paper as well. Are, are you, as CCPI people, are you planning a, or have a paper on all of this already? Or? Um, this is something I think, yeah, we need to discuss how to distribute things. Um, I mean, in, in general, we would like to have a paper saying that it's it's quite flexible you can you can use it along with other things but it might be it i mean we're open to discussing whether this would go in in this paper you are you're planning that might be an option as well um yeah it, it becomes it becomes a little bit complicated yes because in, in some sense i feel that the cil thing is your toy, so you it, that publication should be led by you, uh, and then we we in the surf paper we say uh, we can use this stuff, and then maybe we can refer to something of you or or whatever. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say we discuss surf and CIL in all glory in one paper. That's just going to be no, no. Oh. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe it's better that, that you refer to something we provide you with. Either right. if we have, I don't know if we can have, if we have a paper or at least, at least a software. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, well, I think it's in the plan anyway, at some point to, sure. to come out. But it depends on the timeline of this paper of yours, if, if there's some. Thing. I think we will not, we'll never be able to do it before you. Yeah. So is that for this computer physics right. yeah. special issue thing? Right. So I've heard that the final deadline on that one is in July, but we hope to submit uh, in March. End of March, probably. Anyway. Right. W with that, I think it'll be easier if you refer to like the SIL website or something like that. We'll maybe discuss with Eduardo how we how we do this best. Yeah. Maybe what we, uh, I mean, if you're okay with it, maybe we could include an example of reconstructed images or so that we hold the discussion at the library to use. Yeah, let, let's, sure. can I get back to you on that? Nick? Hey. We just need to discuss a few things, yeah, yeah. how we want to go with this. Um, but I, I, I like the idea. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, it's complicated. Right? Great. But, you know, independent of all of that, I think it's fantastic as that we put this together. Uh, thanks especially to, to Edo to uh, pull it off. So, thanks a lot. Great. Uh, good. So, uh, the next item that we had was uh, the surf fresh capabilities here. So I guess you would have to stop sharing again. Thank 
is in Python. Yes, otherwise, stop the presentation. Move this bottle somewhere else. So my, my Can you see that? Yes, we can see and hear. Okay. Um, well, I suppose I'll go through this pretty quickly because a lot of you are familiar with it. Um, uh, so we've now uh, put the, all the registration stuff um, into into the main branch of stuff. So it's a, a wrapper around. It was just an if, initially a wrapper around Nifty Reg. But now I suppose it has a lot of its own functionality. So it's also a wrapper around the, the native Nifty format. And the same as all the rest of SERP, it's available in, in C++ and MATLAB uh, and in Python. Uh, as I said, we've now merged it into the master, which is great. Uh, it took a, quite a while, but now it's there. And it's enabled by default. So if ever you're, if that, you feel like messing around, please give it a go. And so we have all the re resampling functionality from Nifty Reg, as well as all, all of its uh, registration, which is uh, which means we can do uh, rigid, affine, and non-rigid registrations. Um, so that's all great. Recently, we've done a, a restructuring of all of the image hierarchy in in Surf, and I'll sort of explain it. But this means that we can now register and resample different types of images so we can resample stir and gatatron as well as the 50 image data. and so the, the the hierarchy looks something like this so everything is a a data container of which it's either an acquisition data so you know if we're talking about pairs it's a sinogram or it's an it's an image an image data and of those we we inherit to a uh derived to a stir image data a gatatron images vector which is just a contains a vector of each of the slices, or, or it's a, a nifty image data, and feasibly in the future, when we put in extra engines, we have extra image types. But the important thing is obviously that they all come from some, some common location, um, which has to be there if we're then thinking of in the future about doing any sort of synergy. They have to be, they will have to come from like a, a similar source. And it means that we can have uh, common methods uh, such as cloning and we can do maths on them and all that sort of stuff. Good. So we put in um, uh, an extra class that lives inside of the image data. So obviously all of the drive classes can access it. And it's called uh, box live geometrical info. And it's the minimum amount of information we need to, to figure out where that image is in 3D space. And so in each time when we construct an image, when we read it or anything like that from any of the drive file formats, um, as long as we can uh, populate this class of geometrical info, then we should be able to switch between different image types. Um, so from this, we create a constructor in Nifty image data that will accept uh, any other image data, and using its geometrical info, we can then uh, make a, we can create a new image uh, using this geometrical info, and then the the voxel values from any of the other image types. And once we can then create everything into a, a Nifty image data, we can therefore do all the registration and resampling. So the long and short of it is, by putting this in, we can then do registration and resampling of, of different image types, which was the goal. Good stuff. Um, so here on the right, you can see, I've kept this pretty short. Um, this is a Python example, and I suppose the interesting thing here is uh, is the idea that the image types can be of, of any different type is what I'm trying to draw the attention to here. So I'm saying port, um, the thing that I'm going to refer to as, as, as my uh, reference engine is going to be pista, the thing that I'm going to refer to as my 
floating engine is going to be key Gadatron. And obviously, they can change however you want. It could be P Reg if you wanted to read it as a nifty P Stub Gadatron in the future of the Reg for engines. They could be other things as well. So then I'm just going to, all of them have uh, a, a class in them called image data. Um, so I can, regardless of, of what this actually is, in this case it's P stir, but it could be something else, I can then open a, an image data. So in this example, I've said my reference image is a, um, an interfile stir image. And my floating image is uh, an H5 um, image for an ISM RMRD format. Good. Uh, I create uh, my registration, which in this case is the Aladdin, which is either my rigid or refined uh, registration class. I set my reference to my both image. Any extra things could go in here, you know, how many iterations I want to do, what sort of stuff. Do my registration and get my output. So uh, here, so I, I can, by setting, when I'm setting it, there can be any image type that it will accept any image type uh, as an argument. And it's only when you click the process that it'll say, if you're not already a nifty image, I'm going to have to use this geometrical info that I was describing earlier. I'm going to have to recreate a nifty image. And then that gets passed into nifty rates the same as, as normal. And then it'll do the registrations. The output uh, is then created, sort of tricky, is a clone of the reference with the voxel data from the floating. And the reason you would want to do that is, I mean, here in this example, I've said, um, I want to be doing, say, a PET reconstruction, and I want to be using uh, an MR prior. So then I'm going to uh, register the two of them, and then I want my MR image to be in the STIR image format. So that's why here my, my reference is, is a STIR, uh, my floating is my MR image. And so then at the end, I'm going to create a, a, a STIR image that has the voxel value from my MR image. So does that make sense? What extension of the Oh, sorry, it should be HV. Yeah, but I mean the the point being that it's that it's stuff. Uh, sorry. Uh, so that does this Aladdin already do? Uh, so because I would expect just to have a uh, rigid or a fine. Does it do more? I think it does only. Uh, Aladdin only does rigid or fine. Right. Uh, there's another one. It's called F3D, and that does the non-rigid one. And in your set parameters, you can tell it whether you want it to be rigid or whether you want it to be fine. And I think in the example that's in the surf repository, um, even the this uh, the algorithm that it uses, the class that it uses to do the registration, is variable. So you can say if you want it to do rigid, it will, this will then become F3D. And if you wanted to, sorry, if you want to do rigid, this will be Aladdin. And if you wanted to do non-rigid, this will become F3D. Okay. So this yeah. this basically it's a resampler. This is registration, but if, if the, the resampling, considering I haven't given any property, any any parameters or anything like that, they would look identical. It's only that the, I mean, if you're doing registration, typically there's more parameters than there would be if you're doing resampling. Okay, thank you. Um, and the, the resampling class is called uh, Nifty Resample. <laughs> Sorry, are you going to include more the registration? Toolboxes for this, or is it? Setting up. Are you including more than Nifty Reg for this registration? Uh, currently, no, because it takes a fair bit of time. But in theory, if somebody was willing to do it, yes, definitely. <laughs> if somebody else has uh, Somebody else, you had to say. Yeah? <laughs> You already embarked in the in the nifty range. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not that I'm sold to it, but it's uh, but it's it's functional and it's there. So, uh, question on that, Richard. So, originally we had a fairly substantial pull request. I can't remember how many lines of code, but five thousand or something like that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that. No. Yeah, 14,000 things. Yes. Uh, so, a lot of that has, in some sense, moved to, well, all of it has moved to serve, but I mean, the, the actual serve wrench part of it has moved to uh, split between things that are now in serve, like the image data, general hierarchy, and whatever. Um, uh, 
then some generic registration stuff, and then the nifty bit in its own. So we have a feel how large the nifty bit, forget about I.O. I That's just the wrapper around nifty reg. Right. Uh, is still larger than I, I would expect it to be for another package. I, I couldn't put a number on it, but it's um, nifty reg, the registration package, doesn't do a whole lot of checks. And also the, the nifty as a, a file format, obviously because it scores, for example, its data as a void pointer, there's not a lot of checks that are going in there. If you were, say, to use something like um, an ITK-based one, presumably they would be doing a lot more of those sorts of checks. So I would imagine that A, because we already have the foundations of having just a registration package in there, and B, the fact that I think other registration packages might be easier to wrap up. Um, I, I would hope that any, any future ones would be easier. I, I couldn't put a number on that. Yeah. So things like file formats and whatever are, are always a pain, but uh, obviously there's interest in using IPK. Uh, and luckily with the IPK, all of the geometry stuff we already have under control. And I own, yeah. And I own so on. Uh, so all of that would become quite easy, but then you still have to wrap the registration. It's self screening. Sure. I think it might be easier in the sense that, um, that, as I say, the foundation's already been laid by putting a different registration package in there. It might be trickier because then you have to try and find common points between different packages, sure. you know. Can I just ask a quick question? Hi, this is Christoph from Berlin okay. speaking. Um, I basically have two questions. The first would be um, in the registration, how it's set up now, does it then also, does, does Nifty Reg already take care then of all like different voxel size and everything? Or do the images have to have like the same similar voxel sizes or something? Or is it then resampled in, internally already? Uh, through resampling, yeah. It doesn't have to it will be the same voxel sizes of the two images. Okay. And the, the second question would be um, once you have to do the registration, can you get the registration parameters out already? or do you just get the resampled image out? Um, you can get your information fields and all that. And the you, when you say the parameters, do you mean, what, what do you mean by parameters? Do you mean the input information which you just gave it to, to do it? Or do you mean things like the transformation matrices or deformation fields or displacement fields, all that sort of stuff? Exactly, the deformation fields or like the affine transformation parameters or something like that. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, sorry, I haven't put this in an example, but, but yes. Okay. And you can chain them if you want to do multiple registration. Yeah. yeah. So you can feed one into the next. Yeah, yeah. And you could, and uh, if you're doing a, a non rigid registration, you can also give it an initial um, affine uh, or an initial register, uh, uh, transformation, regardless of what type it is. Yeah. Good. Um, great. Oh, I. I Sorry, I've only, so here I've only given an example code for, for registration. If you were to do resampling, you can say um, add a transformation. And in, in this register, the way we've set it up, uh, it will then store a vector of transformations. And it doesn't care whether those are affine transformations uh, or whether they're given in either displacement field images or deformation field images. It doesn't care. It will just store them all in, in a, a vector, which is of the abstract uh, type. And then it will chain them together in the order that you give it to them. So you can you can chain together multiple different uh, transformations if you want when you're doing your resampling. Good. So that's Python. Here's the MATLAB, and so it looks almost the same. So I'm not going to go through it. The interesting part is at the top here, in which in Python we said import um, pReg as uh, and uh, we said import pster as um, as eng ref and the way you can't really do aliases in in matlab in the same way uh, when you're cool, when you're adding a, an external clib and so the way we did it was through this function which actually this this is sort of nitty gritty it will then return a struct called eng ref which has all of the hand which has handles to all of the classes which are inside of mster which isn't very interesting for you guys. Just the end product is that then you can use it in the same way which you would use it in Python. So the, 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 the idea is the end product is the same, just in MATLAB it's slightly trickier and it took us a while to figure out how to do that. And, and now we can do that, so that's, that's quite useful. Okay. Good. 
Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we've, we've shifted around the image hierarchy in, in Surf. We think it's a little bit better. But, uh, once we can do that, we can convert different image types into the nifty format. And once we can do that, we can then do any registering resampling of, of the different image types. Uh, we also put in aliases into MATLABs. Caveats, we're not quite there with, uh, with Gadgetron images. And it's something I've been chatting, well, you might have seen it in all of the email threads going around, uh, something we're still trying to figure out. Uh, but it's essentially just crawling through the ISM RMRD metadata and figuring out what that means and, uh, for us on, on sort of the server side. And the second caveat is that we can't do uh, motion estimation during the reconstruction process, which is something which obviously we need to be doing. Okay, that's it. Sorry, did I maybe already said it? Did you do the transpose transformation? Um, which is what you need for a script. Oh yeah, sorry, no, we do the. So it's always just the inverse. The inverse, yeah. So. Uh, so. You it must has have a lot of experience by now, whether that's actually meaningful for things like obscure image. Uh, it, in most cases it isn't, but in some cases it is. Uh, we we have examples where we think activity accumulates because if we were using the inversion first we were transfer. Um, and Nifty Reg clearly uses the transpose operation, but we still haven't managed to find where they use that and how, and probably it's just how it coded in the whole cost function thing as opposed to having it separate out. Uh, now but you do do it in stir. Sure, because it's not integrated in this package. But it, is that something that would be I mean is it worth digging through the nifty reg source code or is it something we can use we can sort of lift from stir and put into stir. We have our, you know, instead of being a wraparound if ready, we have our own functionality, which well, we could do, but then we are sort of writing registration packages instead, of which would be fun. But, um, uh, uh, I mean, that, that would be a useful thing to do, and I don't think it would be very hard, but nevertheless, the Nifty Rich bit is vastly more sophisticated. So, um, it's one of the things that. Alex will try and dig into. Uh, complication a little bit is that we are not quite sure where Nifty Rich is going and who is maintaining it at the moment. Is it, is it uh, Mark Moda? Is it uh, somebody else at King's? Is it somebody at CL? Are they forking whatever? I don't know. Uh, and I don't think. Uh, well, I'd be talking to Jamie McCullough, who is the new search by flop, and I don't think he knows either. So that's a bit of a complication. On, on the other hand, Jamie's group is working quite hard on a uh, what they call Nifty Momo package for motion modeling, which is based on the Nifty Reg code, which does contain gradients and, and all of that. Um, and he wants to open source that. Now, uh, that how uh, that then sits together in Nifty Rich, you have to, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Jamie is Alex's second supervisor, so we do have that connection. But that will happen, how uh, soon I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's essential that we're able to do this for, for our work, but it will happen. Sure. Great. Yep. Good. So, uh, I mean, whoever wants to talk about uh, the hackathon stuff, uh, I added the slide at the end, by the way, which is just, it's just <laughs> in case I've memorized them all by heart and I get thrown off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Just before Christmas, we held a, a hackathon, a two-day hackathon, um, and so we got together with a bunch of twelve of us, 
uh, to try and uh, work together on some core issues of SERP and try and implement some new algorithms and all that sort of stuff. Um, we, so then just recently in the, um, uh, Chris said earlier, we, we submitted a, an abstract to the PSMR and sort of the, the objective of the, of the submission was to say, uh, SERP is really great, not only can you do all your reconstructions, but it's actually a good tool for implementing new algorithms. And, and we use the case of point of, you know, in sort of a two day hackathon, here's some stuff that we managed to throw together. Um, so some of the guys, notably the guys that joined us uh, from Kings were new to surf. And so part, part of the first day was spent uh, getting them familiar with, with surf itself. Um, and then after that, we split, um, split up into different groups where some of us, some of them were, were using um, synergistic algorithms that have been developed before and trying to get those into, into SERP. Uh, trying to resolve some, some remaining issues about the MMR and then uh, some of the registration stuff, which I just talked about. Uh, so for the training, uh, we use the SURF exercises, which we've used at uh, a few conferences now. So uh, they were getting pretty, I think, uh, pretty well refined, and I think uh, generally uh, well received. And and Evgeny's written in that uh, quite rightly that these were then some of the example scripts which are in in the, that repository were then used as the starting point for some of the synergistic algorithms which they were coding uh, later on in the, in the hackathon. Uh, this is how we sort of, uh, how we were doing the contributions. We created a, a new repository, uh, serve contribs, and, and then everyone could create, uh, everyone had right access to that. And I think, so do we have, you're getting, do we have three or four projects? I can't remember. We created three or four branches, or how many were needed for the different topics we were working on. It was, but it was done by topic, topic by topic as opposed to person by person, right? So we create a, a branch for a, for a given topic and then three or four people who are working on that can all push to the same, to the same source. That's how we're doing it. Cool. Um, and so then as with any hackathon, the idea is not to do things cleanly, but to do things quickly. I mean, just to make the most progress possible and then go back and potentially tidy it up later. Um, and we we're only developing in Python because obviously it's, it's quickest to do to prototype them. Good. Um, that's a lot of text. Do you want me to read it out? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you all 30 seconds to read it, take notes. There'll be questions at the end. Uh, I don't know if it's already reported on the website by now. Or? Uh, yeah, it's so Chris, just uh, the, the website has received no uh, updates since Monday at least because I cannot really work with, uh, with this problem of authentication. Yeah. So we, we kind of blocked there until they fix this certificate. Anyway, so there was a, there was a modified uh, De Piero algorithm uh, which got in, implemented for two different cases. Uh, uniform weights and using a uh, Bausch weights, uh, where you can. <laughs> I'll let you keep reading yourself. <laughs> and and so if if you've seen the abstract that went around, Sam uh, finished implementing it after the hackathon and has created some, some nice images out of it, where he got the Bausch weights from uh, his uh, T1 weighted enlarged. They're the end. Okay. So you got that to look forward to. Um, this is sort of everything that I've just I've just talked about. Is that sort of fine? I should mention it, beforehand it was called Surf Reg. It's now just called Registration or Reg or whatever because it's now part of the, the Surf main package. Uh, so Abby, who's one of uh, Andrew's uh, PhD students, uh, is No, he's way, way postdoc. Sorry, postdocs. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> has, uh, has developed his, his synergistic algorithm. So then uh, one of the groups was working on, uh, him and, and Camilla were working on, on porting that into, into Surf.
that seems to say that it worked quite well for a 2D data set. So, good stuff. I don't know, is there any questions about that? I'm not the right person to ask. Maybe Andrew and Chris. I, 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 I guess the only way to make is that I don't think it is now is to the world doing machine learning. Boring. Yeah, and it's all old stuff. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Joke. <laughs> Good. Uh, so then Sam Camilla and Abby were working on a, a Gaussian kernel prior. Um, so th was, was this using a, a, the prior class? Was this Abby's prior class? Yeah. So they took some existing Python code and turned that into a prior class. Um, which I suppose at the end we'll talk about how we could get that into the surf stuff. And again, it seems to say that it worked pretty well. He said, when he says it was debugged, does that mean by the end there weren't any bugs there? Uh, the, the prior thing, I think they did get that to work, yeah. Sure. Right. Good. Well, that's what he's doing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Eduardo was working on some uh, some of the CIL stuff, which I mean has since then come on even further. So that's part of the stuff that he was he was just presenting now. So I think we'll stay on that. Uh, and so overall, everybody loved it. Uh, I found that two and a half days was a good amount of time, and they, the the training was useful at the beginning. It's joy upwards, not ugly. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, and so thanks to the Kings team for, for hosting us, obviously. Here's some pictures. So this, uh, this on the right is, is the uh, image we constructed with the Bauscher, Bauscher weights from the uh, T1 weighted them up. So he just committed that. Just during the meeting, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. the, so the script is there. So this this huge measure data. So all, all the work that was done before that to make that happen. Uh, but he said that it needs to have your uh, MR out to the pet. So that needs to be done separately. But with the registration thing, that should not really be a problem anymore. We think uh, it would run one. Without, without prior first and registering and then we continue from there. Sure. Yeah. So that could be useful added in some of the more as part of the other one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh that's Sam's work and I see them put in oh because we saw Edward those images already. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good, yeah. awesome. Great. Any other questions? No. Okay, so let me try to um, call this um, justice to Alex slide. Uh, it's in your downloads, but where do I get it and the PDF? Uh, bottom right. The fold thing there, yeah. And press the top arrow thing. working uh, on the painful business of getting uh, these signal there uh, supported in on stir so once that's done the integration into surf will be on the trivial side um, so uh, 
she has been trying to, this was all working in, in decent shape for non time of flight pet since uh, Nikos released the time of flight uh, uh, pull request uh, for Stir. She then tried to get that data to work, uh, I mean, that code to work on the signal. So that means it's not trivial because you need to understand how GE encodes time of flight information and to make sure that that's then compatible with the rest of the story. Uh, and that has uh, created some interesting discussions on how this should be done and whatever. I don't, I think we, we are there, but there are still a bit, a few gremlins under, but uh, let's just see at some of the results. Um, so what she's been doing, she has the GE pet toolbox and support from, from GE kindly acknowledged uh, uh, Kristen Wangeren and, and Kaspar does so help her a lot. Uh, to, so what she did was then use, you have a list mode file and you get into uh, a, a stir assigning room, but she also does that with the GE pet toolbox and those two should be the same as if you flip things and whatever accordingly. So, and that's the validation bit. And then she just ran reconstructions so uh, you know, I think so. It's all in HDF five, and so we we have the relevant classes there. So if you have an uncompressed list mode file, we can't handle compressed data because we don't know what the compression uh, algorithm is, and GE won't disclose that. Uh, so if you if you need to uncompress it on the scanner, and then so we'll just handle it. And these are examples of uh, the uh, simitrums that she's getting different time of flight bins with the pet toolbox and stir, and so they look the same. Uh, and actually, she also did different and whatever, and they're the same. Yes. Um, and then uh, here she has a slide where there is still some stuff that she says on the rotated MRAC images. I thought that was sorted by now, but uh, maybe not. So um, that will, okay, well, that, that maybe needs a, a little bit of work there. This has to do with the, the first view on uh, Instur is not orthogonal, well, on the GE data is not orthogonal. So she put all that stuff in view offset in, but somehow maybe that hasn't been merged into this branch. Anyway. So um, she scans often phantom patient data sets, also point sources there, what she calls the VQC. I don't know what it stands for, but it's GE uh, terminology for the spatial calibration between the MR and uh, PET. Uh, and so she's been using uh, STIR, top of OSCM, and also the list mode uh, STIR reconstructions and compare that to what the scanner does. Uh, she hasn't applied randoms and scatter over here. Random she can do without any trouble. Uh, scatter, we don't have time of flight scatter. Oh, we just don't have it. Um, so these are example images. Uh, the first question from Nikos was, uh, which is which? Uh, now I'm sure that if you look at it, uh, on, on a monitor and whatever, you will see that the GE reconstructions are better than the stir ones. It would be kind of amazing if they're not, but um, nevertheless, kind of good results. The, uh, we can do the list mode well with the G pet toolbox. You can't. She also had the non time of flight ones on here uh, originally, but uh, they're not on the slide, and you see the difference between time of flight and non time of flight. Uh, Okay, so uh, she was quite happy with all of this. I think there is a, there's still some discussion on is the time of flight implementation 100% correct? And I don't think it is um, because it, it, if we also tried implement uh, validation with gate simulations and they use different file format obviously and then you, you have to understand all of that and there, are, there seem to be some weird things going on. Uh, which is why it hasn't emerged yet. Um, but otherwise, I mean, it's starting to be to look good. Uh, we don't, she doesn't have implemented that time correction. 
Uh, don't know if you'll ever get there. We have, we know how to do it. It's not terribly hard, but you need to read other things from the header and sponsors. So yeah. And then the VQC offsets are the gantries are not necessarily aligned like with the Siemens system, and that's something that uh, Ash has been working on to try to fit that in, but that isn't really either. But so that's sort of a one or two millimeter offset that we might have between the two. Okay. That's what uh, that's where she is. Is there any questions? So it, it, it just goes, just want to say that uh, it has taken her a long time, and um, that's not because it's her fault, it's just this stuff is painful. And to understand the file formats and whatever I do, and, and you know, flipping in all possible directions and Whatever, it's just painful. So it'll be great if um, this will be there because it will also form the basis for other G scans. Okay, good. So thanks to Palak and with help from uh, Nikos and Elise and on the time of flight stuff. Quite a lot of it. Okay, I think. Um, we are then now in the pre-discussion part. Um, let's go back to our agenda. Yeah, so next steps for a synergistic reconstruction, I think um, we should have some some discussion on, on what we think we are still missing and uh, how we get there and then also a discussion on, on surf 2. So um, I suppose I should try and give you my point of view first on the synergistic reconstruction. So obviously a crucial part for the synergistic reconstruction is the alignment between the two, otherwise nothing can happen. And so we couldn't do that, but now we can. Um, ideally, we sort out any issues that um, Richard was alluding to, as far as really knowing where these coordinate systems are in the gantry from the both sets of, of data, but if we don't, I think we can get away by doing essentially registration and resampling as soon as we would have the transpose transformation. We could say, this is my image in a MR space, I now resample it to PET and I compute my prior over there and, and vice versa. That's not ideal because you would have too many resamplings in a way, but it can be done. It would also, if you want to reconstruct them in different boxes sizes, that's what you would have to do anyway. So I, I think um, with that trick, I mean, you've, you've seen the Boucher stuff, there is no reason why it wouldn't go the other way around. So my feeling is that um, with a little bit, with the addition of the transpose transformation, which we could initially replace by an inverse one. I think we can actually do this now, um, which we haven't tried. But one maybe missing bit there is that uh, we probably, in, in our original thinking anyway, we wanted to have a MR objective function, which we don't really have, but maybe via the CIL stuff that now has become trivial. They already have an objective function there, which is easy to implement for MR. Uh, so combining the two objective functions, uh, if you would have the CIL stuff, also becomes quite easy. So um, I think it would be something quite good to try maybe in our next hackathon or whoever feels a bit before that to see if we can do a joint pet and a I think we can do it. So that's good news. Uh, might be too optimistic. So does anybody have any 
comments or questions on how we should take this forward? No, it's still a jury. The geometry thing is painful. No. Uh, understanding where the energy is in relation to the scan of the isocentric. And in, I mean, in separate work where we've just been doing MR, you might be essentially resorted to what you just said, doing registrations to try and get things in alignment, rather than trying to fully understand it. So, I mean, my gut reaction is always, it's always better to try and properly understand what's going on, but simply often difficult to know exactly what steps have been applied throughout the acquisition process. So, I'd say go ahead and get. You know, Necessary user registration to get things into alignment to start. Uh, anybody or possibly Andrew, do you know of uh, people having published where they do where, where they stick the registration or resampling inside synergistic algorithms? Have you guys? No, it's so obviously the way Alpha did it was a very straightforward way. It's what you know full well now. So just. Uh, Couple of iterations, map the end, couple of iterations of yeah. contribution, uh, least squares, spreading percent. And then all you do is just resample into uh, a space so that you can get uh, the, um, the weights for the quadratic penalty for each of the two algorithms. So two iterations of pet, two iterations of spreading um, percent, resample, and then that gives you the information for the prior. So it's a very brute force, blunt, intuitive approach, which has been allowed to be published in MRM. So, oh, yeah. so when you say resample, that means that if you know, if it's just a case of resampling, that means that they're already in the same space. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. It's just, just resampling into the different voxel. So it's just potentially our problem because we right. don't. Right. No. But obviously we don't need any of the transpose stuff. Yeah. Right, because you're... So what we're doing, doing is, is just taking the current two images and uh, kind of considering them together in the same space. Whether for the MR space or the PET space. So it's really straightforward. Okay, so let me try and say this again. So right. you, you have your two PET and your MR images. Suppose we have a registration that goes from one or to the other. So now you say, let me do a few of PET registrations. Oh, I need an MR. I'll resample my MR in that. I then find my weights over here. Right. I do a normal pet reconstruction with a fixed MR anyway. Who cares about transposes and so on? Now you have your pet, you resample that to MR. You just go ahead on your MR reconstructions and whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's only ever for transforming and resampling, absolutely. Yeah. Because it's only used in the weights for the prior, it's not being used in a, a system wide kind of approach. Right. Yeah. So that, yeah, that we can do. That. But, it, but it is, yeah, I mean, arguably, it's, a, you know, it's the trouble is it's a moving objective function. So you're changing your map objective every update, um, which could be an advantage because uh, you've got a sort of non convex problem with a possibly nice solution, which you might not be able to define in a more simplified objective function. So, yeah. um, but I, I think, honestly, more fundamentally, sorry to challenge the whole name of what we're doing here but we keep calling it synergistic reconstruction and do we do we really really believe that at the end of the day is that implying are we really going to be bringing much to the mr unless we deliberately mess up our mr acquisition so that it's completely lousy and then we do get synergy yeah, hey. <laughs> courtesy of pet just uh, increase your unsampling rate uh but, uh, but that's because we're constantly calling it that, and yeah, we, we might run into issues there because that question is going to come up more and more, of course. Sure. Keep going, so, just, so, where's the improvement in the MR? Sure. So, I would, I would, so that's a, a very valid question, but I would sort of get around that question by saying nobody said it was synergistic between just PET and MR. Uh, right. It is between all the MR sequences. Absolutely. Well. Yeah. And that. Clearly, there yeah. is scope there to. I mean, I mean, I mean so Abbott's method works really yeah. best of all within just multimodal uh, yeah. MR. It's beautiful, that. Yeah. yeah, and and, and whatever we do there will, will apply. Yes, it's not yeah. that much of a problem. I think at least our ASL image was not good. So, uh, yeah, Abbott was about to publish using the same method for ASL. Yeah, so that, that, will, that will work. Uh, 
and the uh, I don't know how many of our CCPI friends are all, are still there, but they are working on uh, multispectral CT and the same models they apply over there. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. So we're kind of safe. We're not making any claim about yeah. tech helping. I think we. I mean, as far as this grant goes, anyway, from a grant perspective, what we said, we would provide the tools to be able to do this stuff. Not that we said that it was actually going to work. You know, as long as the tools work, our grant is okay. No? I mean, uh, and, and nobody, nobody disputes. Uh, let me say that. Guys, we don't hear you anymore. I'm hoping that uh, people can still or again hear us. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. You saw we, we turned around when we started talking. We don't see any more the slides. Now we see the slides. There are no useful slides anyway. Uh, so that's okay. Um, we lost a bit of internet connection for a bit. Uh, so we were still discussing on synergy. I think. Um, on the traditional PETMR front, I think this there's more scope for synergy once you start to talk about motion and dynamics and so on, as opposed to just static reconstruction. And uh, that is still the way, uh, but that's okay. Richard has about a year to solve that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that re does require more stuff in the whole thing. But it's, we all know that motion information from MR can help that we also have uh, at UCL a lot of experience in getting motion information from PET that then can help on the, on the MR side, not really as far as registration stuff goes, but uh, just knowing that there is some kind of motion. Uh, and it, it, would, it would still help for other cases as well. The dynamic MR side versus PET MR is a little bit more uh, yeah, sort of uh, uh, who knows really if it's going to work, yes or no. And that's where the, the feature lies and the edge size of it we, that we have, I think. Uh, but that will need, on the motion side, that will need. Uh, I think the, well, probably the joint motion and registration estimation type of thing needs to be in there and, and possibly the motion modeling sites as well. Uh, but Alex solves that one in a, in a month, so we're in, in good shape, uh, who knows. Uh, dynamics, we can do dynamics on PET, but we don't have any, any experience whatsoever with the dynamics. Uh, in MR, in, in my group, but David does have a lot, and you guys do more as well now with the ASL side, and so, so maybe we can still get that done by uh, March 2020. Okay, any, any other comments from anybody on uh, Synergy? Could you concretely name which algorithms you're considering in the future? Um, I think I well, obviously the MAP-EM one is sort of 
almost there, I think, in the contracts one. Well. Uh, I think for us, uh, UCL perspective, it would be good to add uh, Matthias's uh, PLS stuff. I mean, we have the PLS stuff already, but we don't have the alternating between uh, MR and PET or something, but I think that should really not be hard to do. I, I personally feel that being able to do this in a joint optimization as opposed to alternating thing would be interesting to do. Uh, and I know we will have problems with local minima and so on, but we can probably initialize that okay by doing some bits of alternating first and then and then do the joint optimization. Um, we we do that more and more locally we have our work on, on scatter and so on where uh, alternating works okay but it just works very slow but if you do that in a joint optimization thing it's just move faster because who knows if your objective function is optimizable by going in, in square steps you know it's might you want to go in a diagonal probably and uh, if that's going to make a big difference for the, the mouse side, I don't know, but uh, and, you know, we should be able to do it. I don't, can't see a major problem with all, all the infrastructure that we have. So I think if we, summarizing that, I think if we have the map here and we have an alternating PLS and we have one where we have a, an objective function based joint optimization one, uh, and those are examples to build on them. Uh, okay. Good. So, on uh, how are we doing time wise? Uh, well, we have had plenty of time, yes. That does normally happen. Uh, <laughs> good. So, uh, uh, Chris from, from RAL, we will have to leave the room at three. Yeah? Oh, okay. Um, well, fine. So, uh, do you still have Gemma with you or not? Hello, yes, I'm still here. Hi, good, good. Thank you for, for keeping uh, in, interested. So, uh, we, we're about to go to the surf release too, but it might be useful because we're still there to have a, uh, because we have time anyway, to have a conversation on uh, continuous integration testing and Anvil and so on. Uh, now that okay. you are there, so would you mind just giving us, a, I don't know, three minutes or whatever and just chat a bit about what Anvil does for people who don't know? Yeah, sure. So, well, Anvil is a yeah, continuous integration. Does everyone know what continuous integration is? Not really. Not really. Okay. Well, um, so what it is, is it's a independent platform that can build your software and we can set it up so it does it automatically um, upon commits to repositories so it just means that every time someone makes a commit on a repository um, an independent system will then build that um, bit of software and if you've got any tests included then it can on those tests as well and it just makes sure that everything therefore is still working um, especially if you've got multiple collaborators on the same project then no one's going to you know you might have something that's working on your own system but it might have broken something on someone else's system possibly so um, having this independent area to run all these tests for you and for it to be done automatically whenever you make a commit means you just don't have to worry about it so that's generally what it's for and we have it's um we we use something called jenkins um which is some open source continuous integration software and um yeah we run that within the software engineering group and we're um, going to put your projects or some of your codes anyway onto the um, service and get you all set up with it that's the plan anyway um, we have um, so there's various um, VMs that get built and then on so when, when a job gets kicked off um, then a VM gets built and then the jobs run on that built, um, on that VM at the time so we have various software that we have to have sort of pre-installed so um, in your, it might involve us adding some more software um, for your projects, but that's okay. We should be able to do that. 
So yeah, um, any questions? Can you build, can you publish artifacts? You can, yeah, I think you can. So um, in terms of what we've got- Artifacts, he said, can you publish artifacts? That's what he said? Yes. Okay, maybe- so I, I, can, I can comment on the CCPI, we have uh, mm -hmm. continuous integration on Anvil and we build and if the, the build is successful, we, are, we push our software binaries to comb that channel. So yes, you can. Depends on what you do, right? Oh, so um, you create some binaries which you then push out to some release page so that people can then build. Yeah. Like you automatically build the virtual machine, for example. Yeah, so you need to keep that. That means that you could have exactly as you said a ready pre-built image, and then and it'll have the most up-to-date version of work. So well, it could version. either be the most, yeah, it could either be like the latest release, or it could be every single. So, which, which is what we, well, we, I say generally, see, I mean, Castor is doing the docker on Travis at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're trying to, yeah. It, it should work, except there's, there's an issue with the docker build, but it was working. Like every time you tag a new commit, you have to push it. That has a separate kind of tag, so you don't have to push it. Yeah. yeah. It's the intention to replace Travis. So, uh, well, I, I guess we'll have to see how well Anvil works uh, as a challenge for you, John. Uh, so, nothing stops us from just running it on both. You know? So, I should maybe just mention that at the moment, um, operating system so obviously it's reasonably easy for us to add software. It's um, operating system wise, though, we've currently got. Um, we've got a few Mac nodes and we've got Linux. We don't have Windows yet, and that's going to be harder for us to get because of the various licensing issues. But under Linux, we've got um, scientific Linux. We've got Ubuntu. I think that's all we've got at the moment. We've got a couple of versions of scientific Linux. So. Yeah, yeah, we've got a few versions <coughs> of scientific Linux and yeah, we've got a couple of Ubuntu as well. Can you do, can you do Docker? Well, does it support sorry? Docker? Does it support Docker? Can you run Docker within new containers? Can you run Docker within the job? Um, I don't know. It's like one so of no issues, one's doing that at the moment. One of the issues what? with um, Travis was that it doesn't support Docker within Mac containers. Yeah. Hmm. So I, we're not doing that at the moment. I can look into it. Um, hmm, uh, yeah. If, yeah, if you can, uh, the reason, aside from just having general fun, uh, the, the, the practical reason for it is that we rely on, on Gadgetron to do a lot of computations of it, and, and the Gadgetron build is really quite complicated. And, their project is sort of jumping around a little bit, and they do don't do continuous integration testing on Mac anymore. Uh, <clears throat> so, but they do supply a Docker uh, container, and so it would be good for us for the continuous integration testing, but actually also for the users to just be able to run their Docker container, and then they don't have to bother with building it. Right. I see. Okay. Okay, well, yeah, I'll have a look into that and get back to you. Yeah, Matt Love, so that, that is something that I asked Catherine, um, well, I don't know, a year and a half ago. I, 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 last <laughs> time I saw her, she said this was going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. But I don't know if there is an update on that. Um, Matt Love is this. Yeah, she's handed that over to me now. So um, I am in the process of trying to get a Matt Love license. So, um, we did used to have one, but it's expired. And yes, as you say, things have sort of lapsed a bit in that area. So um, now that I'm taking that on, we'll um, hopefully get it sorted. Yeah, we should be able to get something. That would, that would be good, but obviously we don't have that at the moment. Before, yet. Uh, 
Oh, on the on the subject of MATLAB, are there any particular toolboxes or any sort of specific MATLAB requirements you have? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but it, it, it might. Because you know, with MATLAB, you have to pay for like set, some toolboxes are included, aren't they? But other toolboxes you have to pay extra for. So it just, or you could always someone could always send it to me in an email, maybe if you need time to think about it. But it would be because it's not much good us getting MATLAB if we then don't have the toolboxes that you need. So, uh, in some sense, it's a bit hard for us to know because the university just gets all of them, and so we we never know. But uh, I think we could easily write our tests without using any of the toolboxes. Really, we uh, our, our build doesn't rely on any of the toolboxes. So I would guess okay. that there might be a Okay. Uh, okay. So that would be that would be great to, to have that. Um, the old reason to go to Antel is that we have support for that uh, from uh, from a group. So that's great. While well, for Travis, we don't really have any. But, uh, Travis also, I mean, it's huge, which is an advantage, but it also means that sometimes they, they fall over and your jobs crash for reasons that don't have anything to do with it. Just really and you see, oh, it's red, and then that's actually because they had some network problem. So I'm guessing or hoping that would be less the case with that. Um, but I can I can give you already a difference between Travis and uh, and Jenkins we are facing. So currently, Travis has a report on on the build that. So for a PR, for instance, right? So each PR at the bottom has this uh, report, which is specific to the branch <coughs> and to the build. And we are not able to do that with Anvil at the minute, or I think we will not be able to do it because of, uh, there is one user in Anvil, I don't know exactly, Alan tried to explain to me, but <laughs> I didn't want to understand, so. So basically, at the minute, what we uh, came up with with Alan and Tomas is that each pull request gets built, but they they all end up in one in one queue. So you will have a report of uh, of the build if it worked uh, for the development branch, say. Uh, and then you you can go and see if it crashes, but you know you don't know if it's my branch or if you branch or uh, somebody else's branch and that the, the only thing that we managed to do as to is to receive emails from Jenkins which is not very nice but we could create a mailing list for builds oh yeah I more email, yeah <laughs> um, uh, that's not so good obviously because uh, in contrast to CCPI I think where you are generating all the pull requests <laughs> in our so, exactly. it just can't record it as the correct connect. It just doesn't have an interface which shows you where it comes from. Uh, Sorry, are you asking something to me? Yeah, no, I'm asking. Like it's so it's it's building all of the different branches, it's just not telling you that it's a different branch. Right. Yeah, so I think. Uh, to get access to which branch is being built, there must be some interaction between Jenkins and GitHub. And uh, for some mysterious reason that I haven't investigated or, and I don't want to know probably, this doesn't happen like in Travis because of something. And it's like impossible to reconciliate, I, I think. It might, it's probably a problem with the GitHub plugin that's been written for Jenkins. I would imagine yeah. we're limited by that for a few things. Right, probably. Yeah, that might, might be a problem because not all our pull requests are from branches. The CCP pattern are repository, obviously. A lot of them are actually from people's own pork or whatever. So that but you can set, you could set up different jobs for different branches. I, I have that in another CCP that um, that I work with, and we have um, like for each feature branch, there's a job for um, different. So all feature branches have something in common, and we have a number of jobs set up for a number of different feature branches. 
so um, you can see what's being run from what branch by that way. I don't know whether that sort of setup would work for you as well or not. Well, it, okay. it, it, it would work for the larger features, but we, we try and keep our pull requests now as small as possible. Uh, and some of them are there for a few days and then they get merged and they disappear. Uh, it's not ideal. Uh, but okay, we'll, we'll need to get some more experience with this as well. Uh, I think we can we can try it out with the CCPI thingy. Um, yeah, sure. We already have something in, in place, so mm -hmm. it's going to be easier. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, we, we will, I think uh, we just have to try and, and see how far this helps us. Out. And even if it's something that's complementary to the Travis thing, it still help. Even if we say we can only run uh, the Jenkins build on the master uh, with MATLAB and so on that would be useful. The moment we don't have that, now we can fix MATLAB so. Great. Thank so the you. other thing I wanted to ask you, Chris, do you think you want to create a virtual machine and uh, kind of upload it to the website? Because it still requires some manual intervention, I think. Uh, I think that would be fun, but you know, uh, if, if, if the vagrant stuff uh, all works completely automatically, then in principle, I suppose, vagrant could be put onto, onto Anvil and it could all build from there, but I can see us spending two, three weeks on that <laughs> before it works. So, I don't know. Let's I, wait I, until I finish the Conda uh, pull request. I don't know. I don't think that has anything to do with it, but anyway. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it would be nice, but the virtual machine creation thing is not something which we do all the time. It's sort of once, right. you know, twice per year or so, maybe. The, the reason for my question about uh, artifacts was actually related to that, that if you had a, if you had a bare machine, that maybe you just pull the entire contents of what you built straight well, down onto the machine. So you don't have to, have to go through the whole, all the steps of building the machine. Just spin it up and stick it on. Yeah. Have a machine that you update as opposed to <coughs> building. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think um, we should probably try and shift our focus a little bit away from uh, fancy things that we can distribute and whatever in, in funky ways. Uh, I, I think we need to get the software advancing more than all the other good mechanisms. Uh, while we keep the other things alive and we improve them, but I think our focus should be on adding new capabilities. Being able to deploy it in many different ways. Um, okay, thanks, Gemma. That's really useful. Um, okay. Uh, on on the serve two front. Um, so it, it, this is a, a little bit difficult uh, because I don't think we should go into uh, a ton of detail of this right now because then uh, some people will just get very bored but um, if I try and go I thought maybe what we could do is uh, I don't really open this, sorry is have a look at our uh, long-term plan which has been updated 10 months ago which means it will be vastly out of date i did have a look at it just before the meeting and i said yes it's, it is vastly so um and maybe we can sort of say how this needs to be updated for version two and then some things later on and that might be a useful discussion to have now as opposed to going through issues and see which 
points can be solved because that's not this audience so we can do that uh, in one of our t-cons um, so uh, obviously version one has been released this here says version 1.x uh, and then version two below now uh, i guess i'm still sharing yes okay the this document hasn't been updated and in the sense that what's called surf 1.x here is now well he said we would put a version 2 in between because of uh, incompatibility so we have to increment our major version and then actually what's going to be in version 2 is sort of a, a mix of what is here 1.x and version 2 and probably some version 3 stuff on our long term plan as well um, so uh, let me just try and go through these things over here that we have so forget about the labels of the uh, releases there so the uh, it says addition of non-time of flight scatter and ge signal pet mr is our major plan for pet additions and so sadly i mean okay maybe i should say we uh, plan to have a version two uh, before we submit the paper, which is end of March at the latest. And there are a few reasons for that. One is that we have moved on quite dramatically. Another reason is that the paper comes with uh, the software. It's sort of the software. It's packaged and will be part of the paper. And therefore, it makes sense to have it as a release, yes, as opposed to something which is halfway in between. Um, so uh, that means we can't be um, too ambitious or shouldn't be ambitious at all of version two. And if necessary, we could uh, have a, a separate branch for version two while other things get still added later on, uh, new features if we wanted to. Not sure that necessary. Okay, so the non time of flight scatter relies on stir updates which have been put in by Nikos who is, who is online now uh, but um, I don't think we can merge those at all right now because there are we haven't really tested this in in a lot of detail with Vika uh, one of my PhD students had some comments on it and some improvements whatever so this will definitely have to go to 2.1 that's I think okay because major in increments should can add feet sorry should be there for incompatibilities but then minor increments are there for additional features so it makes a lot of sense to say we put uh, time of flight non time of flight scattering 2.1 because it's it won't break any practice compatibility and the same for the uh the sigma at the bar we can just do that without breaking backwards compatibility um, improved documentation, well, is something that Evgeny has been working on continuously and uh, he needs to catch up a little bit, but you know, yes, and that, that is happening uh, every day a little bit, so uh, that's obviously not a problem there. Uh, it says uh, Windows, I've, uh, we have been struggling a little bit with that again in particular recently my feeling is that it would be safer to say that we keep uh, windows support for 2.1 as opposed to 2.0 if we can get it sorted and maybe maybe by now it is with the question that you asked i don't know i haven't checked yet then that would be great but if it isn't well so be it um, i had a question there but maybe the relevant people are not in the audience but the last thing that i heard which is about a year ago was that nifty reg didn't build on windows so i think i guess nobody has ever tried i don't okay, i can't remember so it's, yeah it, it might be on this machine for me now. <laughs> yeah um so it, it's well for something to just check and potentially set the default build of nifty range for version 2 to off on windows at the moment um 
the person who was working on this was Phil Noonan, uh, but that was when he was still at UCL, so that's a while ago. Um, it was one of his tasks from Seb, I don't know if that's still on his task list. So, yeah. Uh, but in any case, uh, sadly, I think we need to postpone Windows 2.1 right now. Um, paper currently talks about Windows. Sorry? Paper draft currently talks about Windows. Okay. Right, good. So it, it, it works, but you know, building is still a pain. That's the sort of the problem. Uh, okay, but we also set a small database of uh, phantom data for testing now. Uh, that is not really part of the release, uh, but. So it looks like the director just built on Windows. Okay. Built, that's good. Uh, it's installed. Oh, yeah, whether, whether it works or not. <laughs> that? <laughs> 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 well, that's that's good news anyway. Um, so the uh, I, I think our database with phantom data is sort of a separate discussion to have really. That we do plan a few more acquisitions whenever they're going to happen. I don't know. Right. So what we then have uh, scroll down a bit first. It's called EA version two. I had major features that didn't make it into serve one version. Then C interface. So that has been improved uh, quite a lot, and I think uh, that's still also under uh, continuous progress, but it's much better shape than it was before. Uh, Swig would be nice, but uh, we're not going to do that for, for our what we now call version two, so I'll, I'll scroll down just a little. Uh, uh, by the way, SWIG is uh, a, wrap, uh, a separate tool to generate wrappers for different languages. So you give it the C++ code and it generates you the Python interface itself. We use it a little bit, but not a lot. Um, they are um, working towards the version 4 release in the coming month or two, which will include the experimental MATLAB support, so at least uh, that's good. And if we can use it, yes, we will we'll, we'll find out in the future. Uh, the geometric information stuff is obviously there, so we should adjust this uh, and, and move our long-term plan uh, according to what's already in there. Common image objects and so on is also there. Uh, says shape classes will work at NMR. I don't know if that's true. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, is that an easy thing to add for version two or not? Uh, do you read the shape classes? I guess you rely on the service third side for this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think what we can do is have a demo how you could use this. We, we can uh, have with the resampling, we can have an MR image and then put it in pet space, do the shape, the shape classes and, and put it back. We can do that. It's awkward, but it can be done. Uh, so we use it for some of the demos to say, well, I want to find a cylinder and a Oh. And the lip store with them, whatever, to build your own phantom. Okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's much simpler than doing. Yeah. Actually, I've never thought of it. Yeah, you, don't, you don't want to write your own shape classes now, but the question is can we use the stir one so for a gadget image in some fashion? Uh, again, that can easily be, be 2.1. But it, it was on there. Pet uh, reconstruction with MR and Tom Comprise, we can do. MR reconstruction via Gadgetron, in some sense, we can't do. Um, what we can do is do our own iterative reconstruction, but it doesn't really call Gadgetron at all for any of this. Uh, so we need to adjust that. So uh, I don't know. There, there are probably gadgets from classes for it to be construction gadgets for it to be construction that we could call. 
I have no experience with that at all. I don't know if Christoph is still there, if can comment on it, or David. I don't know, but if we try to do synergistics, show how useful they can be. No. I'm not going to break in. Yeah. Well, I know it's open source, but. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite a nice way to get into Gatter Charts, maybe it's because we're just open source thing. Yeah, it, it sort of depends. If there happens to be a gadget like there is one for Grappa that now says compress sensing, boom, 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 then I'm, I, it will take any half a day, I suppose, to get it to work. But, um, yeah, then it would be sensibly wrapping yeah. that gadget because that would certainly wouldn't have any ability to go no. feed some pet data into that. No, that would be quite hard. And I yeah, think that that's still be useful. But I think in general, people might find it useful if they have an easy sensible. Uh, we have to leave the room, so uh, we we will close our connection from the this oh. room. But I try to keep my computer running, so it will be possibly recording. Oh. Right, uh, will it interfere with the recording? It should drop out. Or... I, I I leave my computer open, so it, it should continue to record. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Gemma. Um, with all latency reconstruction in Gatchetron, um, uh, I, the only experience I have is kind of with, with 2D radial acquisitions. And for those, there are several gadgets, and you can kind of select which kind of iterative reconstruction you want to do. But again, as David mentioned, it's, you put the raw data in and you get the final image out, you can't interact with it. Um. But it is very easy to, like, very straightforward to use. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think if you if you send an example of, of the relevant gadget, an XML file to your Genie, and you can have a look, and that we can use and add 2.1 as opposed to 2, yes, of the problem. But if, if it takes him half an hour, well. <laughs> And we can add it now, but I, I, I don't think it's a, it's a major priority here. Yeah, it's more a question, I guess, of, of having data to test it. Um, All right. right, okay. Okay. All right, so let's put this as 2.1 then, yes. Uh, good. Uh, Full support for measured sequence data. So, well, uh, we still don't have a letter from Siemens that we can disclose bits from MRAC. And Jörn Jacobi says he's trying to chase it. Uh, yeah, still not there. Now, without that, we're doing pretty okay, as you've seen earlier on. Uh, the, what we don't have. There, I think the only thing that we're missing is uh, the gantry alignment stuff, but we do that the other registration or can do that the other registration at the moment anyway. So, uh, in some sense, it's sort of there. Uh, the EV set 2.1. Uh, MR, there is a offer from GE uh, that Julian organized. Uh, to test the gadget from, I suppose, GE to ISM and MRD converter. They were willing to help us with that. Uh, you, before you can run this, you need to have access to Orchestra, which is the GE tool, and you need to build the converter and probably also gadget from with the, the specific HDF5 libraries that the Orchestra uses. And, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, it's documented on the gadget front side uh, or the ISM and MRD side. So they were willing to help with that. I haven't pushed that at all because uh, for several reasons. One, I don't have time to, I don't have a GE scanner, it's not very good. Uh, so if somebody is interested in that, uh, that offer is there. And we'll take it up once we have a little bit more slack, I think. Um, 
MR sequences which we support is still a bit of an uh, unknown to me, in all honesty. The big thing there is uh, Gadgetron supports far more MR sequences than what our acquisition model does. Our acquisition model is, is on the trivial slide and it's essentially just to the Cartesian um, with under sampling uh, repetitions that's more or less what it does, I think. Um, so that's just what we have to list for version two, I'm sure. The uh, I, I think we have to make a decision on how we expand this to other sequences. Why? So there's, there's two ways, I believe, to do this. Um, so I'll tell you your opinion. One is to try and get Gadgetron to do these forward and transpose models for us, which means adding extra capabilities to Gadgetron for having uh, the, I don't know how you call them, the buckets to, to be able to support acquisition data, which I believe Thomas Kustner has sorted out, um, as far as I recall, um, because they, they needed that for their uh, uh, motion stuff at the time. But I don't, yeah, and it's way beyond what I know really. That would be, I think that would be necessary and I think would be quite useful if we have that and especially if Thomas has it all done for us, then maybe it might be easy. If it isn't, then we have to go the way to say, well, we really implement our acquisition model ourselves, like again, you did now based on some example I said around our decode. But that, that leaves us in the interesting situation that really we're not using the gadget from at all, except maybe for some oversampling corrections and so on, which might be a relief. Uh, but that's a kind of a major decision to take, I think, because implementing support for different MR sequences to me doesn't sound easy, but I don't know. Uh, but what do you mean with different sequences exactly? Well, we can't do radial sampling, we can't do spiral, we can't do 3D, uh, whatever. Well, I mean, 3D, of course, but that should be more or less straightforward. We talk about 3D Cartesian. And I guess um, spiral would be, of course, interesting, but is also not supported by Siemens, as far as I know. Uh, they, they do have Petra, which is far uh, So work in progress, I suppose. But yeah, but like, like it's not, not part of the standard protocols, is it? No, I guess not. I and don't know what the Scaparinia thing is. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think it's all good here. Um, and so it would only basically be radial, yeah. But yeah, but then again, also like on the standard Siemens scanner, you can also just do like normal radio, not something like golden cut or something. So all of these would be kind of um, sequences you either need to obtain through special whips or write yourself. Sure. Um, so I, I probably think, as I, I don't know, in my, in my opinion, it would probably make more sense to to have these acquisition models done ourselves. In the end, it's not that difficult if we can more or less paste and copy from Gadgetron. Um, rather than trying to really use the Gadgetron functionality in the in in surf and then have gadget the standard Gadgetron reconstruction more for the or like like a reference reconstruction, like a grappa reconstruction or something. Because in my opinion, the, the the difficult part is not to to really have the final acquisition model, but the difficult part is always to get all this sorting right and and 
yeah, making sure that you are, you know where you have acquired your phase encoding points, where under sampling was, where reference lines is. And I think for this catch return is great. Um, but then the acquisition model, I think, is quite easy. I actually agree with Christoph. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, if you if you shout a little bit louder. <laughs> yeah, I have a cold. Uh, is it better? Yes. Okay. No, I actually agree with what Christopher was saying. So it depends on what we want because a lot of the non-Cartesian is, is research-based. And, and as he say, that will depend if you can actually acquire that data. So I agree that it will be very important to have it for Cartesian and maybe, maybe the efforts should be in going into 3D Cartesian rather than going into radial or spirals. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting, yes, because we, yeah. Anyway, we, we sort of, Spent a lot of time on Gadstrom and wasted a lot of time on Gadstrom. Um, but uh, they always say you have to be able to cut your losses. So. <laughs> um, I mean, I suppose just looking back, the reason we went to it was it was open source and that it was uh, able to handle large volumes of things. Of those things were still going true, but it fit so well with. Getting into acquisition mode. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. I mean, I, obviously, this isn't anywhere close to version two, but uh, or two point zero in any case. Um, I do understand that. I mean. It's not just doing a Fourier transform the whole thing, and you have to be able to understand where is center of case space, and you need, you need for your particular sampling line, and, and you need to know, oh, it's a dual echo, it goes in this direction, that direction, and all of that stuff. It doesn't, doesn't strike me as easy, not something that if again, you can just go away and do. I think that's more or less impossible. Um, so is there, is there code that we can still copy, use, uh, whatever, contribute? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that, um, I think the difficult part is to get your data, your case-based data kind of in the right format to do your reconstruction. And I know, if I understood you correctly, you're saying like a little bit that, well, we went all through the trouble of catch and and then we are not really using it. But I think actually the parts we are using it, just making sure we in the end get like a case space where all the, the data is sorted in correctly and we know kind of our reference line, we can calculate the coil maps and everything. That's really, really valuable. And that's probably more difficult than in the end, because in the end it is just a Fourier transform you're doing. And yes, for radial, you would do like a grading step beforehand, but also, I mean, that's not that difficult and has been done before. It's also just a function call. Um, so I think once you, once you add the step um, where all your data is nicely sorted, then to actually write the acquisition model, which goes back and forth between your case based and the image data is actually really not like, it's not any more difficult than what Evgeny has written now for the 2D case. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we, uh, I think we would need some hand holding there, in all honesty. Uh, I mean, um, um, Johannes has written this, this 3D transform for, already, so I guess he could also provide that. Yeah. And in the end, he has also written, like, because we need it for, for our RP trajectory, we also need, in, in the phase encoding direction, we need the, the, the gridding approach. So that's already also there. So in theory, we could also simplify that and we would already have a, a radial model, for example. Yeah. I think it would actually be not that much work. Uh, I don't know, Claudia, I mean, you, you guys have a ton of stuff, obviously, as well. But yeah, so we'll be happy to contribute. The thing is that we don't do anything at all in Gadgetron. No, no, but so we are saying we don't do Gadgetron. Yes. Oh, yes. Then, then if not, then I think we could 
put uh, some things together depending on what we want to do. So basically we can provide C++, C++ uh, functions and a lot, to be honest, we just do it in, in MATLAB and, and then we just compile it to C. Okay. And, and for that, yeah, we, yeah, we do. We have, as, as uh, Christoph said, we could have something like 3D uh, reconstructions or greeting for radial. Uh, if you really want to do spirals, we can also generate something for spirals. I think it's a point of, of what we would like to have there. But as I, soon as it's not gadget wrong, then we can contribute much more. Yeah, I mean, what we would like, I, I rely completely on the amount of people, yes. Uh, I have no clue. Depends what we're doing. If you were wanting MR as a, just as a prior, say, and you had some wrapper on the sample MR acquisition, then you probably just want to use Gadgeton to reconstruct it. Sure. You don't do it. So, mm -hmm. Then you use, if you're ready to insert the own pet reconstruction using that prior. There's no point copying the functionality of Gadget on there. But you want to hack into the MR reconstruction and all the back of models of them. I suspect that's what doing itself, using, potentially using Gadget on the ISRAM need to do with salt and sugar. Yeah. Okay. How do we how do we progress on this? Well, it's probably a case by case basis. Say okay, this is a particular sequence. This is data that I want to be able to reconstruct. Let's sort out the acquisition model for that data. So what you say? Mm -hmm. uh, well. You're thinking you want an uh, works for everyone. No, 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 I, no, not really. Um, I think as long as the the general framework is followed of having a acquisition model that has the relevant functions, uh, then we don't care really if we need to have a derived class MR acquisition model for my funky new uh, acquisition sequence. Well, that's okay. But I guess that my question is, is if, do we want to do this here? Because at the end we will be replicating other efforts that they are mainly focused on MR for let's say different kind of acquisitions and trajectories and so on. So, as David mentioned, like if, if you if you are maybe not doing MR research and but you want to be able to reconstruct the MR data in order that you can use it as a prior for let's say the pet reconstruction or a joint one, probably you will be doing something simple with the MR. So something like uniform undersampling or like grappa or sense or things like that in 2D and 3D. And probably you won't have any of the non-Cartesian trajectories. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, and then if you are really doing something extra, then there are other open source softwares that they, they already have developed a lot and they, are, they have a huge advantage with respect to us. Yeah, yeah. Um. And, and I will say the, the most commonly used now is actually BART and not really Gadgetron. Uh, no, uh, Okay, I I don't think we should look at serve as a pet reconstruction toolkit with a bit of MR thrown in. I mean, that was not our intention, yes. Uh, that is maybe the interest of the people who have used it is sits there, but uh, it would be a little bit disappointing if that's what it ends up being. I think if we if we say we it was all, always the plan anyway to be able to handle MR data or MR reconstruction of different sequences, whatever inside serve. Uh, that was the 
is what we set out to do. Um, but we're not really doing it at the moment. But I, uh, I think I think we can do it. I just would like to know the scope of it. So, how much replication of of what is done already we will be doing, or how how different we want to do it, and 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 then maybe that's why it's important to define what we want to do. Like as I say at the at the beginning, in 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 my opinion, then we should be doing two D Cartesian, three D Cartesian first, and maybe something simple for non-Cartesian, like 2D radial or something like that, that, that then it can be extended by the users depending on their own specific uh, research. Uh, I, I completely agree with you, Claudia, but I'm, I'm looking at the audience to sort of make that. <laughs> and if, uh, if we say, you know, all of that functionality of we need or, or 90% of that functionality that we need is in BART. Well, then we probably should have a closer look at BART, you know. Uh, there is no point of duplicating it. That is the whole thing about so that we don't want to duplicate mm -hmm. our yeah. I think it would be a mistake. Mm -hmm. The serve is never going to keep up with the our work, really. From <laughs> well, we parts. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, implementing or extending the 2D acquisition model to 3D would probably take Evgeny an afternoon. Mm. Um, sure. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, like Johannes is probably happy to, to show Evgeny <coughs> what he's been doing and then basically just copy and paste there. So that, that should also then make sure that, like, if you have undersampling and all these things are also taken care of. Um, and then I think if you want to have a radial acquisition, then I think that would be a great topic like for a hackathon, for example, mm -hmm. and could definitely be the something for Surf 3.0, for example. And then if you are Claudia, somebody from Claudia's group and, and somebody from my group and, and if Kenny sit down at the hackathon, and I think they can easily get the, the 2D radial done in, in a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so the, the, the question of using something like Bart or so is, is, is still on the table. But I'm not sure that um, it, it's a question of using gadget or Bart will solve that because Bart is also, it's the functionality is quite in, enclosed in there. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know, I don't have that much experience with Bart, but I don't think it's that easy to just take out the acquisition model from there, from one of the iterative reconstructions. So, uh, as I say, I don't think um, the, the, the acquisition model is not, not the difficult part of the iterative reconstruction. So. Right. I mean, the 3D, the fully sample 3D, the acquisition model would change by inserting FFT, FFT chip, that's it. But, well, then so, uh, <laughs> yes, but in practice, never, yeah, because yeah. the data needs to be 3D and all of that stuff, yeah. which, which is a problem, uh, but okay. So I think we all agree that we put in 3D in there, for yeah. example, 3D is, should be there. Sure. All Cartesian stuff is all the way. Okay. Good. I think we do, we do have to sort of move on. Uh, let me, so... So let's say we do 3D Cartesian for 2.1, yes? And then we have the, uh, not for 2.0, for 2.1. Uh, we have all the sequences still scheduled for version 3, whenever that will be. Pet uh, dynamics and gated reconstruction inside SURF is definitely not a, a 2.0 thing, sadly, uh, because of data structures mostly. And so, I don't really know if he can do this backwards compatible, so it will be 2.5, but I hope he can. Uh, of support will be 2.1, because that will be uh, almost uh, transparent, I think. Um, Substance of acquisition data is a continuing discussion point. Uh, but uh, it's probably a 3.0, I would think. Um, interface of motion estimation, well, that's done. And, uh, um, right. 
in source with pre-compiled data uh, software. I think it's sort of on the 3.0 realm as well. Okay, I think we have to stop there with this overview uh, because it's too hard. So I, I hope Richard made diligent notes and we can adjust this uh, after we need. Good, so then I try and go back to my future meetings and any other business. Um, there's a lot of question marks on here. So we, we have been asked suddenly to do the uh, PSMR reconstruction course. Uh, still don't know yet if we're doing, if we're doing it yes or no. Uh, it depends essentially on our instructors. And Claudio was going to ask a few people about <laughs> kids as well. I don't know if Johannes would be willing to, to help Christoph or, uh, or you. Mm, I, will, I will definitely ask him again, yeah. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, it's the week before Easter, which is kind of terrible, but anyway. Uh, so we need to decide that mid next week with the very latest that we could uh, say yes or no. So I, I think it would be good. Sorry, what, what are we waiting on? MR people to volunteer to actually do something. So I'm not going to give you an MR course. <laughs> Chris, uh, Gastel said that he will be happy to do it if it doesn't coincide with another workshop that he has to attend. And I check and it shouldn't, but I can give you a final answer on Monday. Oh, excellent. Great. Uh, Gastel's uh, talk was very well received last time, so that, that's good. But mm -hmm. obviously, he hasn't used surf at all, so we still need somebody else to. To actually do the, the surf side. So I will say that if, if uh, Johannes is the name of your student, Christoph, cannot do it, then I can ask Camilla to try to get a little bit more into and she could do it. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, so we don't have news on our suggested demo of Servitize MRM. Uh, hopefully that will work. Um, I have a question mark, not that Will we have a 24 software meeting? The question is more where and when. Uh, obviously, April, I think, is out. Uh, can't do it before. So uh, that would then be beginning of May, presumably. There is a suggestion from Nikos to, or, or, or uh, an offer to hold it in help, um, which is not the easiest place to get to, maybe. But on the other hand, I think uh, Nicholas, are you on the on the call? Uh, yes, I am. Can can you hear me? Yes, yes. Maybe you can sell it a bit to people. Yeah. So it is actually quite easy to come because from King's Cross, you take the train and in less than two hours with free Wi-Fi, you're in Hull. So oh. it's it's not the worst place. I know that crossing okay. London can take more time than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, then you have a limo to, uh, to pick us up at the airport, uh, sorry, not airport, the uh, train station. Uh, well, there are taxis there and buses. Yeah, they're really expensive. <laughs> That's all right. We have money. <laughs> no, no, no don't, don't worry. It's going to be like five pounds. It's not going to be that much. Um, so is that something that people see? Uh, Going there, I, I, I mean, okay, we have more and more remote attendance, which is fine for me, really, uh, as long as we can have our, our a meeting where we come together, which is fine. I, I think it would be interesting to see another part of England. Um, presumably, not might not be a part of Europe anymore, but <laughs> well, it was once the, uh, the capital. Uh, European yeah, they, capital they, they changed it. They changed it from the European capital to the UK capital. When they go, because yeah, all right, well, so it's not the European. Uh, right. Right. Uh, okay, uh, shall we? So, sort of somewhere after Easter, so I think first week or, of May or something. Does that generally sound like a good idea? Absolutely. Uh, and then, uh, topic wise, it's maybe slightly more contentious, but I thought. Uh, 
we need to have a software meeting on connection between surf and uh, machine learning and deep learning type of things. Now, if we ah, so Casper <laughs> suddenly gets interested. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. That might be somewhat ambitious, maybe, but. Uh, I, it would be good to have a brainstorm on that and what is possible and tools that we need for that and what are we missing. Uh, maybe nothing at all. Um, is that feasible to have that uh, soon or is that something? I mean, what do you mean by machine learning? Like, what do you want to do with machine learning? <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just import <laughs> Easter, import SK learn. So it's done. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, uh, import PyTorch and hear it, boom. I don't know. So, I think that would probably interest a lot of people to then all descend on Hull and uh, swamp the city. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. well, we, get we would get a lot of attendance. Uh, Maybe remote. I mean, so maybe that's then not the best thing to to do well, in the whole. It could be an idea to implement uh, one of those recent papers where they use something like CNN inside the reconstruction process, inside the iterative reconstruction process. So just implement what the paper does, except for the story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that sounds very much like a hackathon topic to, to actually do this stuff. So I think having a meeting before that that discusses various libraries and possibilities is going to be a lot of fun. Um, are people up for that? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then whatever else we have on, on Proteus, obviously. So I. Uh, there isn't, uh, I think, a need for another hackathon, and I, I sort of put that in early summer or so, well, summer presumably starts in June. Uh, it's, uh, would uh, people be willing in that to do that? And then, uh, when would we do it? When would we do it? Um, Harry suggested to have it all in Leeds and up we go all north, but uh, I might be just able to organize it all. Might be interesting to do it in another place again, just to get people from there, also from the Amar side, from Stevens group, a bit more involved maybe, which was quite successful from the King side. Uh, also, it's Frankie's group now in Leeds. I don't know. Yeah. All right, yeah. So uh, if we if we add as a potential topic there merging surf and machine learning and we have to potentially get a lot of people. But it would be good to do that, I think. Um Am I hearing anything about dates or is it completely open for everybody? We are all free, we don't have anything else to do anyway. Um, is June a reasonable target? Somewhere end of June, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we'll, we'll do some doodles and whatever on all of those. Uh, there is still a question mark behind a workshop on Synergistic reconstruction, including multispectral at MIT. I need to push that. It's, there's quite a lot of proposals to the uh, committee over there for workshops. There's about 10, one of them machine learning, obviously, and reconstruction. Uh, so I don't know if this will happen yet or no. Uh, I'll do my best. And then we have our developer team. So am I missing anything of stuff that we should be doing? Oh, good. Is there any other business that people want to raise right now? Or we uh, run over allocated? Oh, I've got four minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs>
Uh, well, many thanks for, for joining for the interesting discussions also for people remotely. Uh, let's keep up the momentum and uh, get some visuals filled in to organize the next. Thank you. Thank you.